No, okay. I don't think so. Okay. I mean, he could potentially. Yeah, like, he is a boy. <laughs> okay, ready to roll. This is the first uh, of a series of dog songs on, uh, sponsored by Wilhar Wellness Systems, which is our new company we started to focus mostly on uh, more on the nutritional aspect of, of what we do here. Um, I've been looking for something for a long time that would, would give us a means of quantifying better like where people are with their health, health-wise. Um, <clears throat> for years, I've been doing a practice 38 years now, and I've used most of kinesiology. I've been to many, many, many seminars with nutrition um, over the years. but. Um, Probably in the hundreds. Yeah, yeah. Lot, always looking like she says, I'm, my wife says, I'm always in search of the Holy Grail. So I don't know that I found the Holy Grail, but I'm getting closer maybe. I think I'm going to find the Holy Grail when I take my last breath. I finally get to meet Jesus and have all these, I always say, if people ask me certain things, I'll say, that's a QFG, that's a question for God. You know, but someday we'll get the answer for it when I go. Lord, Lord, Psoriasis is so hard and so I guess we'll get that someday. But in the meantime, I, a gentleman in, um, in Dayton, Ohio, started to get my attention. Dr. Van Merkel, you'll see his name there on some of the posters. These are his. <clears throat> and he would take out these two page ads in American Chiropractor. He would say, yes, I'm a chiropractor, and yes, these are my patients. And he said, these are my 10 worst cases. And it was the guy, you know, a 14-year-old kid that had a brain tumor that, um, Put on a program and 30 some years later he's in his 40s has a family he was told to operate on him he could probably be in a wheelchair the rest of his life he had astrocytoma and he put him on a program and a few months later the tumor shrunk to the size of a pea which it has maintained for 30 years now and then all the neurological signs were gone the kid went on to get a scholarship to play college ball uh, to live and 10 years and counting no signs of leukemia so he went on, you know, this, and these are some of the cases that he talked about in the seminar. So this got my attention, and he says, you know, if anybody's out there that gets my attention, I go, okay, have to go find out what's going on with them. So I went in August <coughs> and um, took his seminar, and I, I, call, I think I called her up about halfway through, and she's like, don't do anything <laughs> until we talk about it. It was like typical, don't sign anything, don't do anything. And I said, I have to do this. I have to. Don't do this. Do we go? I'm going to do this. Too late. I'm doing it. It's done. <laughs> you know. And that's what I did. And then, and then when she came with me to the next seminar, now she's like the bigger advocate. You have to do more of this. You have to do this. And the reason why is like we saw so many people. You know, in 40 years, I was talking to somebody today. I said, you know, when I started. So the people, you know, I was 24-ish, maybe, and um, a lot of the patients, like, they were 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you know. Well, 40 years later, what are those patients now? If you're in your 20s, you're, you're like me, you're in 60s. If you're in your 30s, you're in your 70s. And you're in your 40s, you're in your 80s. And so what are we seeing happening with these people, people that I've known for a long, long time? Well, dog, I just got tested. I just found out, you know, my sugar's through the roof. Now, now they want me to go on insulin. Well, dog, I just got uh, diagnosed with AFib, and now I'm on four heart medications. And, oh, dog, you know, my, my uh, fibromyalgia is so bad, I'm taking this. They got me on Oxycontin, this, that, whatever. And, and it was like people coming in, you're seeing, like, they're getting drugged up, loaded up with things, having heart attacks, strokes, finding out they have cancer, all these things. And I said, well, you know, there's... There's more that can be done. You know, we know that most of these diseases, these chronic degenerative diseases, can be treated by mostly the best treatment is prevention. Don't get them in the first place. It's kind of like the Bible says, and the you know, light casts out all darkness. And we say in the presence of health, there's no disease. That's one of his things here. If you get healthy enough, it doesn't matter what the name of the disease is. Well, what the name of the disease is, it'll go away. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be a new disease. <clears throat> so... <laughs> um, so that's why we, we kind of decided this was something we had to get into. Applied kinesiology, which I've done for years, is very, very useful, and it, uh, 
even though Dr. Merkel is not a big fan, because he doesn't see it as being scientific. Um, I still feel a lot of things, you know, are are more art than science until the science Mommy. catches up with the art. Mama. And I think applied kinesiology has proven itself uh, over the last 50 years to be a useful tool, but it's not the all-encompassing tool. It's a tool in the toolbox, but it's not the whole thing. Just as blood work and hair analysis and urine analysis and things are other tools. So we needed to just expand the things that we were doing to um, have more objective means of, of assessing where you are with your health. So if you think about it, here we are at the end of the year. We're going to start a new decade, 2020. And this is when everybody gets introspective at the end of the year. You look at, say, where am I? Or today, like, compared to where I, where I was a year ago. Uh, am I better? Am I financially better off? <coughs> am I physically better off? Am I, have I gained weight? Have I lost weight? Am I in better shape uh, as far as exercise-wise? Or And then people make all these, you know, grandiose uh, plans for the new years and all the resolutions. But that's kind of where we're at now. It's like you're kind of assessing where we are. And so how do you assess where you are health-wise? <clears throat> you can go by symptoms, but unfortunately with symptoms, you could have, what, 70% loss of uh, kidney function before you have any symptoms, 80% loss of liver function before you have any mm -hmm. symptoms. So, so how do you know, like, just based off of symptoms alone, whether you're really where you want to be health-wise. So we, again, we need another tool to assess. Uh, a few years ago, I took this guy somewhere. I used to like him, Dr. Malik Slosberg. He is, um, he has now retired, but he would come to Pittsburgh every other year. And I would go to his seminars, and this one here, this was probably the last one he gave before he retired. In the first three hours of the seminar, <coughs> sedentary lifestyle, obesity and diabetes. Diabetes is going to be the new rage of a condition that's going to bankrupt this country and, and keep this country sick. Uh, it's what in Medicare is probably third, right, probably the third leading cause of, of, of health care. So um, he spent the first three hours talking to those three things. And, and one of the things that I learned that I never had heard before was the idea that fat is now considered an endocrine organ because it secretes chemicals into your body. So, and certain chemicals are released, they're called cytokines. Cyto meaning cell. If you remember your biology class or whatever, science class in grade school, what was kinetic? Kinetic energy, what did that refer to? Movement. Potential energy, right? It was energy at rest and kinetic energy, energy of motion. So kinesiology, if we add that to it, kinesiology is the study of mo movement, which turns into the study of muscles and how they affect movement. But if we go to cytokines, cytokines are cell movers. They're chemicals that are released from cells <clears throat> that cause things to happen. So when I foolishly last year cut my hand with a chainsaw and it's bleeding and I'm grabbing it, well, what was my body doing by the time I already got in the house? and I was yelling, medic. <laughs> and the medic said, I better not hear the word chainsaw in the next <laughs> And I was like, but I won't say it. <laughs> but something cut my hand really bad and I need the medic. So, well, what was my body doing as I was squeezing and trying to pull and pull this together? Uh, it was trying to clot, yeah, but it was bringing, like, release from the injured area it was bringing fibrin to try to start already patch the wound. It was bringing white blood cells to start disinfecting because I just breached my body wall and let something now stuff can come in from the outside. So there were chemicals that were being released from the cells to cause certain things to happen. And that's what cytokines are, cell movers. They've learned now that you have cytokines that are released from fat tissue, which what is fat called? Adipose. Adipose. So they're calling these adipocytokines, or for short, adipokines. <clears throat> and what do adipokines do to you or for you? Think anything good or just mostly bad? Unfortunately, nothing good has been discovered so far. Mostly bad. They 
They lead to the development of cardiovascular disease. They lead to the development of adult onset type 2 diabetes. They lead to osteoarthritis. There's actually one of the early studies in this that he presented was linking uh, obesity to osteoarthritis, that, that it actually causes uh, adipocrines cause uh, inflammation. So they are pro-inflammatory, basically. And isn't that the big buzzword today? Everything is about inflammation. And so cytokines are very inflammatory. They're inflammatory for your blood vessels. They're inflammatory for your joints, for everything. Your heart, everything is being affected by adipocrines. So we look at that as typically, oh, fat is just stored, in, stored energy. It's money in the bank. Money in the energy bank is waiting to be spent, you know, if I start working out and exercising. But it's not. It's just not dormant tissue sitting there. It's active biological tissue that's doing a lot of nasty bad things to us, of course. So this becomes something that I think it made me think, you know, as far as myself, that uh, this is something we have to be aware of and combating making part of our health plan to reduce reduce body fat. Um, there are different markers for that. If you were going to measure, like where you're at that point, what are some of the ways you can measure body fat? Well, BMI, the scale. 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 Yeah. Close. Kind of. Yeah. Remember these things? <laughs> Calipers. <laughs> these painful things, you know. Yeah, I don't it's like pinch me. and grab it. <laughs> the thing I didn't like about this, other than the fact it was very painful uh, when you do it, was um, they, these charts always took into consideration age. And as I get older every decade, and I try to keep myself in shape and work out and stuff, I don't like the fact that if I turn 60, I now get into a different category. And if I have the same exact body fat num number from pinching the four typical oh. places you pinch, now all of a sudden I get bumped up and I am into a higher body fat thing just because of the age factor. Okay, so I didn't like that because we, we don't want to do that one. So here's another one. What about this one here? This is a body fat tester, but it also gives you BMI. You know, that your basal metabolic index. And so this is the big thing today. The insurance companies want to know what's your BMI because then we can throw you into a higher rate, you know, for your health insurance and life insurance. If you have a higher BMI, we're going to penalize you for that. But that's your height versus weight index. I don't like this either, because I do that and I lie to it, and I put in my height and my age and whatever, and it tells me I have a 29 point something BMI, which Gina for me, that would not be good for my age, right? <laughs> so for my age, I should be, um, what, for... 20. 25%, 25 but lower. So then if I lie and I put in here and I say not 61, I put in there 51. Well, guess what? Now all of a sudden it gives me a better reading just based on the age. And I'm saying, well, so what if I put 41? I get even a better reading when I do the test because it's factoring in age and it's assuming that as you get older, you get fatter. Even though that could be the exact same frame that I was 20 years ago, uh -oh. and whatever, I'm going to get penalized for this. And then the insurance company is going to use it to spank me. So obviously, I'm not really, I'm not a big fan of that. Either. Now the research is saying, you know what, the best in indicator you can use to predict cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and uh, like your, your risk assessment for, for strokes and heart attacks uh -oh. and stuff is very simply your waist to hip ratio. And so there was a study here. Uh, uh, I don't like this one. Average obese women get one hour of exercise per year. That was a study that actually said that. It said men were better. They get three and a half hours per year. Okay. Per year. <laughs> per year. It wasn't per week. It was <laughs> not per day. No, an hour was, per day. Uh, average obese woman gets the equivalent of one hour of exercise per year. So not good. Um, okay, this is a, they're using abdominal obesity as a major indicator for um, stuff. So trends in mean waist circumference and abdominal obesity among U.S. adults. Journal of American Medical Association, 19, uh, 2014. Uh, they're calling abdominal obesity as a waist circumference greater than 40.2 inches in men and 34.6 inches in women. Uh, significant increases were present in men, oh women. And so we're saying that in the last 20 years, 
these numbers keep going up every year. We're getting bigger every year. Um, the prevalence of adult obesity is increasing. Results support the routine measurement of waist okay. circumference in clinical okay. care as a key step in okay. initiating the prevention, control, and the management of obesity and yeah. diabetes. So they're saying that now this has become um, more of a gold standard that they're recommending that you do for everybody. So how do you do your waist circumference uh, your, your ratio, and then how do you calculate it, and what does it mean? So you take your your and it should be on your bare belly, which I'm not going to do. So we go here. We don't want to talk and, about and it. We, yeah, sure. yeah, we measure at the belly button, which should be our narrowest measurement. And then at our widest measurement at the waist. Okay, so we did mine earlier, right? I have a witness to this. I was about 30, I think 37.5 at the waist, and then 41 at the hips. Okay. And then we measured this out, and it came to roughly 91.91. So for men, you want to see less than or equal to 0.90, and for women, less than or equal to 0.85. So basically, you did 37.5 divided by 41. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you would just take the waist, and then you divide it just like that. So that goes into 40. Obviously, this... If it's less than this, the number would be less than one. If this Yay! would be greater, if this had been, say, 43, greater, that would be a one point something. So then you get like mild risk, moderate risk, and, and severe risk. Uh, and so I think if you look at this, say, 0.90, uh, that would be ideal. 0 0.90 to 0.95 would be a moderate risk. Point, I mean, um, uh, mild risk, 0.95 to 1.0 would yeah. be a moderate risk and 1.0 and above would be a severe risk risk factor. So that's a simple thing that everybody and every one of us can do that uh, would be easy to do at home and easy way to monitor us. Okay, so that's a good assessment tool there. <clears throat> so obviously I got, a, I got a little work trying to do. So we were talking about this this morning. You know, why does this get so hard, especially as you get older? Um, you know, and then what, what's the theories? What do you feel about that? Why do you feel like with each passing decade it gets harder and harder? She was telling me after you had the last kid, 41. What I was saying was that up till about, and I'm the, I always said I'm the expert in weight loss. I mean, I have gained 30 to 40 pounds with every baby and lost it, and we have 10 kids. So that's like 400 pounds. 300 to 400 pounds that I've gained and had to lose. Well, not losing it, obviously, as much. But I felt that up till I was in my um, early 40s that I could lose the weight. I could get back into my clothes mostly. So um, that even after my last child, I was, you know, maybe only 10, 20 pounds more than what I was in high school after I had my 10th child. But then after I got into my upper 40s and into my 50s, now I'm gaining, gaining 20 pounds, you know, and I can't lose it. And I feel like I am, um, I play tennis, I play pickleball, you know, run, walk, whatever, uh, work outside two or three hours a day, like through the summer, working in the garden on a regular basis. I'm not a sedentary person in any way, shape, or form. Even when I'm not exercising, I'm still running around the house. I'm not sedentary. I don't have a sedentary job, but yet I felt like I cannot lose weight, and I don't. And I eat very, very well. Uh, almost no meat. We don't use any white white sugar at all. Um, alternative sugars, alternative flours. Everything we make almost is whole grain. So I'm looking at that and saying, okay, why am I not losing weight easy? It should be very easy. So of course, the best excuse, what's what's always our excuse is. It has to be hormonal, right? It has to be hormonal why we're not losing weight. And so, you know, which is, he was looking for tools to help us. You know, one of our the tools now we're moving into is our science-based nutrition testing. It can test you for that. It can see. And in fairness, uh, we've done about 30, 40 tests so far. And we've found quite a few people that are, that have uh, significant problems with hormones, you know, uh, beginnings of Hashimoto's, you know, um, some thyroid issues or whatever, you're definitely seeing some issues with that. 
You know, and so that's a tool, but that's my best excuse is the hormonal. That's what I want to say is my best excuse. But I know another thing is just that our cellular metabolism slows down as we get older. Mm -hmm. So just in general, it was, well, I would imagine nutrition is a big piece of that too, but just the general process of aging is that we slow down. I don't think our recovery has to slow down. I think our metabolism do slow down because Covert Bailey, that wrote uh, Fit or Fat, talked about that, that as you become more sedentary. And so, again, one of the studies here says Americans today, the average American sits 13 hours a day. The average. And so then they found that... I can't like, imagine what uh, that would be like to sit for 13 minutes yeah, at I don't, once. I don't know how, you yeah. know, like, let alone 13 hours. Yeah, it said, if, like, if you watch more than four hours of television today, it increases your risk for diabetes and heart disease by 46%, uh -huh. 50% watching over to so less than versus people that watch less than two hours of television that's the great the standard on how much television we watch <laughs> but sitting still um, so it said like we need to get moving again we need to get moving and i remember like years ago they talked about um just how like remember, i grew up man i was almost sound like ancient when you had one telephone in the house right one right. Right. so when mom is in the basement and like, mom, got a phone call. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Uh -huh. She runs oh, up the steps and talks on the phone and boom, 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 back downstairs. All right? And then what happened? What came next after the one telephone? Extension. Extension phone. Okay. And now you go hooked up one in the basement. Yeah. So now, mom, you got a phone. Okay, pick up down there. Exactly. Yeah, anyway. Or then you got one upstairs in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. So no more boom, 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 coming downstairs, mm -hmm. running back up. So they said that the loss, I mean, the addition of extension phones cut out so many miles of walking and the exercise going up and down stairs in the home. So it's things like that. One car families. I remember very clearly on 8th Street in Denora, which, you know, we were like downtown, and a stair, there was a staircase, uh, 7th Street steps or 8th Street steps, and then it went up, and then there was another hill, and then where we live, and then another hill, and then. And I re remember people had how many cars back then in ancient uh, times? One, one yeah. car. And who took the car to work? Dad. Dad and who was at home? Mom. Mom. And what did Mom do when she needed groceries? She walked downtown. And I can remember these women with two bags of groceries walking up a street. With their, and, and they'd walk, but they went downtown and came up with their arms full of two brown paper bags full of groceries. Right. See, and so who does that today? Like nobody. So just types of things that we've just found so many ways. And we have Instacart. To, to yeah. move yeah. us. We have to walk around the store. Yeah, 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 we have to walk around the store. store. We can just like call it in. Yeah. Call it in. Phone it in. To the house. I mean, what next? They'll be feeding you next. They'll be like, come in and say, we're well, ready to eat here. Wait, we're going to have to do that. Do So wait, how, much, how much less are we going to do more of <laughs> in our lives? And this is the problem. So, <clears throat> and exercise covers a multitude of sins. So when you talk about like diabetes, heart disease, uh, adult onset diabetes, insulin resistance, one of the best cures is supplement-less, medicine-less exercise. Med, uh, Medscape had an uh, article on it a few years ago. I cut it off. It said they did a study where they took a group of people with high blood pressure, elevated sugar readings, A1Cs, blood sugar, cholesterol, all the parameters that we kind of measure today as being indicators for health. And they put these people on three days a week of moderately intense exercise. I think it was 45 minutes, moderately intense. Not, not killer cutthroat breakneck, but not real easy either. And they found in 90 days, every single parameter of health had, had decreased almost back to normal. Some, in many cases, back to normal, other ones very close to normal. So, and they did zero uh, intervention as far as dietary. So I always tell people, exercise covers a multitude of sins. You know, if we got to exercise, but the caveat there is, we have to make sure exercise isn't gonna kill us because we're in a state that we're not really ready to take on moderately intense exercise. So you have to do gradations. One of the studies here said, it was actually done by the Mayo Clinic. They said, you gotta start somewhere. So they said, standing instead of sitting, everywhere you go, parking in the back of the parking lot, walking more. And if you start doing little things, 
then little I things know. will lead to bigger things. And as you start feeling better doing little things, you'll feel better. You want to do bigger things. And then you'll get back into the, you know, full-blown uh, exercise thing. I like, I like beach body programs. I work out in my house. I gave up on the YMCA and gyms years ago because I'd go there and I'd have like 45 minutes to an hour to work, to work out. And unfortunately, like I knew a lot of people there. I'd be like, Doc, I've got this shoulder problem. What do you think of this? I check it hurts my. You know, I'm really like, yeah, I'm like, I got this time problem that I gotta get in and get out of here quick. And after a while, I quit. I said, I can't fight City Hall. I'm not doing this anymore. So I started working out at home. And that's where I like to do beach body. So we have our little home, home based gym, and that's plenty and fine for me. And then having a farm and cutting wood and gardening and all the other stuff that all counts. That's all, that's all money in the bank when it comes to exercise. So, anyway, that's that. <clears throat> so, those are some of the things like if you think about what can I start doing that costs nothing, easy to implement. And that'll be a factor, but there needs to be something more. Like she said, what is this other factor? We had one of our patients today came in that had started this program about a month ago. And she's 40-ish and not in bad shape to begin with, but she's not feeling good. She's just this general don't feel good like I think I should at 40. Right? And then we did the testing and we found out that she had... Uh, Hashimoto's, you know, auto, autoimmune thyroid disease. So she started on a program, a supplement um, program, and I got off of gluten and got her dairy almost down to nothing. And she came in today and I was looking at her and she wasn't in bad shape to begin with. But I said, you lost weight. And she said, yeah, about eight pounds, you know, in a month. And she goes, I'm back to my high school weight. So again, she wasn't real heavy to begin with. But I could just tell. I said, you, you know, I said, what, what did you? I said, what did you do different? She said, nothing, absolutely nothing. Oh, no, no. Just on the program, just doing the stuff. So, so why would that be a factor? What, what do you think? Like, what would cause somebody and Angie as well to didn't change any other factors? Mm -mm. So why all of a sudden did something kick in and boom, her metabolism is up and she's, and she's losing oh, no, no. and normalizing? We didn't put her on a weight loss program. We didn't talk about weight loss. It wasn't even one of her goals. Her goals was, it was energy, nerve thyroid, digestive. You know, just, I, we didn't know why at the time. But my energy's low. I don't feel good. I have a lot of digestive. I'm always having gall diarrhea, you know, this and that, whatever. And it was, it was, the thyroid was a big part of it. One of the things we're finding in almost everybody is vitamin D deficiency. Mm -hmm. Why do you think... You're, and and if, you know why do we only test vitamin D, Gene? Why don't we test E and A and, and K and the other fat soluble vitamins? Why is vitamin D such a big problem today? Well, one people have become sun phobic, but like with this time of year, you'd say, okay, I can understand. Late fall, winter, winter months, we're not outside and freezing cold where we live up north. That D would be a problem, but it's a problem. We got tested I got in tested August. in August, and we that was after four months of sun, mm -hmm. and it was deficient. Every day. Yeah, every day, two, two every day hours. for hours. Yeah, yep. two, three hours in and the garden. I'm low and she was low D. I was low D. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm here most of the, but when I'm at home, I am outside. Mm -hmm. I am not inside. I can't stand being inside, especially in the summer. There's so much to do for us. So, um, why is everybody low in D? And I think if we're low in D, we're probably low in E, and we're probably low in A, and we're probably low in K the four fat soluble vitamins because almost everybody that I've tested over the years with kinesiology and just, just general testing has gallbladder liver issues. We have gallbladder liver issues. Um, 600,000 gallbladders get hacked out every year in the United States. 600,000. It's a major city. They're taking out gallbladders. Now they're doing them younger and younger. Teenagers, now, I mean, sometimes even hear the horror story of a preteen. And it's like, well, it's going to get bad later anyway, and it's a little sludgy right now, so we might as well get it out of there while we, while we can. Like if there's preventative surgery to remove gallbladders. But what happens when you lose your gallbladder? Uh -oh. You lose your ability to digest protein, fat, and really even complete the digestion of carbs. So without a gallbladder, your fat-soluble vitamins are going to all become deficient because the gallbladder stores bowel salts from the liver and enzymes from the pancreas. And so when the food... Really, I'll show you, this is a common thing that we do wrong. There's your stomach. Then you have 10 inches, you have the duodenal loop, and I'm just going to schematically, there's your liver and your pancreas. 
they come together and form the common bow duct, which empties here in the sphincter of odi in uh, the middle of the duodenal loop. And these two are producing enzymes all the time in a liquid form called bile, B-I-L-E. And it goes down to this little sphincter muscle. You might want to visualize your anal sphincter being shut tight. So it hits this shut tight sphincter and it backs up and it collects in your little bladder that gall or bowel is collected in your gallbladder. And why does the gallbladder collect it there? It's like producing this between meals. And so when the food comes out here, so the, the stomach's job is to take big molecules and turn them into medium-sized molecules. And then when these medium-sized molecules come down here, there's the, the stimulation actually of acid from the stomach is the stimulus to the nervous system to cause the gallbladder to contract. So as the food is coming around this bend, the gallbladder is contracting and squirting enzymes to mix with your food. The bowel salts from the liver, their job is to break down fat, emulsify fat, so they increase its surface area. So if you take a big molecule like this and break it up into a bunch of little ones, the enzymes from the pancreas have a greater surface area to attack and to better digest this big lobule of fat. So that's the function of bowel salts. And then your pancreas has lipase, ACE, uh, ASE is enzyme, lipase, amylase for starch, and then protease sounds like what? Protein. Protein. So protease, so you have these three classes of enzymes that now finish the digestion of fat, uh, carbohydrate, and protein. So if we remove somebody's gallbladder, and why do they get sick in the first place? They get sick, one of the reasons is we diminish every, we've been told that we need to decrease acid in the stomach, okay? That acid's a bad thing, right? Isn't what television teaches you? Mm -hmm. You have the fireman yeah, slide down the pole and you know, the little purple peel and Nexium and all this, and that acid's a bad thing, but is acid a bad thing? No, acid's actually a very good thing in the stomach. It's not a good thing if it leaks up into your esophagus, and that's the job of another sphincter to keep that shut tight so it stays in the stomach. But the acid serves two purposes. One, kill bacteria, disinfect your food. And you think about it, they say, oh, they told me my stomach was too acidic. Well, the, <laughs> is that possible? The pH scale goes from one to 14. Seven is pH balanced or neutral. Less than seven is acid and greater than seven is alkaline, what did the physiology books say about how acid the stomach should be? Guidance for medical physiology says the pH of the stomach should be between 1.6 and 1.8. Okay, when, especially when there's protein being digested in the stomach, it needs to be very acidic to activate your main stomach enzyme, which is called pepsin. So, so one, this kill bacteria, two, activate pepsin, your main stomach enzyme. It works optimally at a pH of 1.6 to 1.8. So would you say that's mildly acid? If we have our one to sevens or acid range, one would be like extremely acid. So we're between one and two. To me, that's still pretty acidic. And if you think about it, this kill bacteria thing, do you ever wonder why buzzards and, you know, all the little uh, carrion eating animals or eating like the dead deer and the dead possum and the dead everything in the middle of the road. And they're out there feasting on that and you wonder, how can they do that and not really get sick? I mean, really get sick, they should be really sick, right? Yeah. They're not cooking it, they're not killing, they're just eating it raw. And it's like full of maggots and everything else. It's just totally nasty. How are they able to do that? Or are they super, like, it's still physiology. How does, how does that happen? because their acid bath of their stomachs is extremely down here as well. And they kill the bacteria that they're bringing in with all the dead stuff that they're eating, right? So that's one of the major functions of us. So if we diminish and we alkalize our stomach, we lose this ability to kill bacteria. And that leads to, I mean, you've all you know, people that have had food poisoning or uh, H. pylori, a new bacterial thing from taking antibiotics and stuff that we, we are alkalizing our stomach. But then here, what about pepsin, their main stomach enzyme? Guidance physiology says that the pH of the stomach goes to 5.0 or greater than the activity of pepsin goes to zero. So 5.0 or above, greater than equal to, that the activity of pepsin goes to 
zero. So what do we then digest as far as are able to digest for protein? Nothing. How much of the protein are we going to digest that we eat? Zero. Did you say protein is important to our body? Mm -hmm. All your hormones, all your cells, all your tissue cells are made from protein. Everything in our body is made from protein. So if we can't digest protein, what's the point of eating at that mm. point? Oh, that tasted really good. Okay, I'm going to get zero out of this, but it tasted really good for a few seconds in my mouth. And then it goes down here, and we're not going to digest it anything because there's no pepsin, non-functional pepsin. What's the other thing we can do to decrease stomach acid? It's very common in our, our society. In our Drinking culture. water when we eat. Yeah. You go to the restaurant, what's the first thing they ask you? Water. Uh, sir, can I, I'm, I'm John. I'm going to be your waiter. Uh, what can I get you to drink? Because we know that you're thinking about the menu, and your, your, your stomach is already producing lots of enzymes and anticipating this wonderful meal that we're going to serve you. So what I need to do now is I need to give you some water or something to dilute all your stomach acid so you don't digest anything that will feed you. The next. <laughs> I mean, really, you think about it. I mean, it's polite and whatever. And so what would probably be the best thing you could order you know, with your meal? I always, what do you see? I say, that's what I don't want I always say, I don't want anything, thank you. And what do they do? The melting they give you water anyway. <laughs> well, sir, I brought you some water. Yeah. <laughs> you really don't know what yeah. you want. So here, we're going to give you some water anyway. <laughs> So, but what would be better to drink? Kombucha, wine, anything fermented. Something fermented, yeah, wine, kombucha, something that was fermented. That's like wine is acetic acid. So it's something that's acidic, and that's why you have all these wine tasting things, and this is the wine you eat with fish, this is the wine you eat with beef, because certain wines, are they, they enhance digestion. Water does not enhance digestion. Milk does not enhance digestion. You know, so these okay. other things you stick in, they're diluting your stomach acid and screwing up your digestion. So if you've already whacked your stomach and, and messed this up, then the acid from the stomach, the pH here should be about three to four. I don't know why nothing's going to work anymore here. Um, that trigger, three to four, is what triggers your gallbladder to contract. Now it's three to four, and that's a chemical stimulation to cause the skull better to contract and start storing your enzymes on your food. So if this coming out of your stomach is six, seven, or eight, you're going to get a very weak stimulation for your gall better to contract, and you're going to get poor digestion. So you're not going to get a good breakdown of protein, fat, and whatever. Plus, you're going to have more bacteria and things coming in. So as this food moves down lower down into your GI tract, what do you think your body's going to do with it? If it's not broken down, if not at a point that it can be absorbed and broken down, what do you think your immune system, which 75% of your immune system is in your gut, 75%, what do you think it does when all this undigested food stuff starts coming further down into your gut? Is what? it going to say, okay, here it comes, let's absorb it anyway? Mm -mm. Or it's going to say, what? Get it out of oh. here. And what's that going to give you? Diarrhea, irritable bowel, ulcerative place. So this sets you up for all these bowel troubles you're hearing people having today. Uh, IBS, irritable bowel, Crohn's, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So we sabotage our digestion, and then eventually, like your gallbladder will get inflamed, it'll get over because it's not emptying real well. Oh my God. There's some other factors at play here too, why the gallbladder uh -oh. will get sick, but ultimately will get sick, or you'll have an attack. And when you have that attack, when you go to the hospital emergency room, you'll be on the table the next day getting your gallbladder out. And I remember um, I, had, I had hernia operation 2013, the day before Thanksgiving, and I was drinking my allergies on the way in the hospital because I was getting myself ready, you know, I was prepping myself for my recovery already. And I had talked to the nurse the night before, and I said, what can I eat or drink? She said, no, no food after midnight. I said, what about drinks? She goes, only clear liquid. And I said, well, so carrot juice is out. She said, yeah, that's out. I said, what about aloe vera? If it was clear, like a natural aloe. She said, well, if it's clear, you can drink it. Okay, so I'm drinking on the way to the hospital. Like, so then when I get there, the uh, uh, anesthesiologist said, when was the last time you drank? And I said, about an hour ago. She says, what did you drink? I said, it's an aloe. It was clear. <laughs> she goes, who told you you could drink it? I said, the nurse did. And, like, last night. <laughs> and so she goes, well, I'm not signing off on this. I'm not going to have you aspirate doing surgery and die on my watch. She said, she goes, so, she goes uh, I'm, I'm not approving this, so you're going to have to wait for four hours. So she put me on the wait list. So the surgeon came in and said, look, you know, a week from now or four hours, 
story's not going to matter one bit. Just listen to your music and enjoy, and I'll, I'll do the lady after you. Well, the lady after me was about 30-ish years old. She had her whole family there, and they're all kissing her goodbye like she's going off to war or something. And they're willing her past me, and then I could take you know, from the, the conversation that she was in going to get her gallbladder out. And she looked fine. I mean, she started talking and everything else. And she's going to the person, the willing her, she's going, so your, your gallbladder is really not important, right? And they're going, no, that's right, it's not. And he goes, so you can live without it. Just, oh, yeah, it's just it's like your appendix. You know, it's like you can take it out. It won't be any problems. And, and I'm going, that's not true. <laughs> like, yeah, come back. I can save you. Don't let him do it. And they rolled her off, you know, into um, take another gallbladder off. All right, anyway, so. Yeah, that's another one bites the dust. And then when you explain all this to them afterwards and they feel like they had that buyer's remorse, like, why didn't anybody tell me? I said, it's fine, you can take it out. From the moment that's gone from your body, you're not going to digest any food for the rest of your life. You're going to have to take enzymes and bile salts in, in, you know, as you eat the rest of your life. And they go, nobody told me that. And, said, and they don't do it. People don't. No, they don't no. do it. You're right. They don't. They're, very few. Very few um, get it. Like some will do it for a month, some will do it for a little while, and then they'll say, you're taking your enzymes, you're taking your bowel salts, uh, and then I get away from it. I saw what you were broke. I'll screw back. Uh, no, I don't think you're going to go back. Why would you quit? I said, for the rest of your life, unless you don't care to digest. Mommy, mommy. So anyway, that's why I think, so when you lose the ability to digest fat, why we're seeing D, E, and I'm sure A, and K, I'm sure they're deficient. You can just look at a lot of the symptoms. And uh, A is like your main vitamin for skin, also A and E for skin, A for hair. In our, in our notebooks, um, in our notes from science-based nutrition, they have like diagonal paragraph three columns of all the diseases that can be linked to A, D, and E deficiencies. You no, know, which is and then the clotting factors. Why so many people bruise so easy? You know, vitamin K. They're they're losing that. That's another fat soluble vitamin. So anyway, uh, what we do with the science based nutrition is you're going to do a blood test. that's a little more uh, comprehensive. comprehensive than your typical one. Actually, um, about twice as many. Yeah, he keeps and he keeps adding stuff too. I, I, I I'm always amazed that already in the short period of time we've been involved, how they keep adding things to the profile. Like they added to Quest recently, they added TPO antibodies, which is one of your thyroid antibodies. It was an add-on. Like when Angie did the mm -hmm. test, we had to add it on. Mm -hmm. And when the other girl that I told you about did the test, we had to add it on as an additional test. Uh, but now they do one of those in the test. I just saw that they're adding uh, BNP which is a heart marker. They're adding two of the heart um, uh, screening uh, exam, like they're on the heart uh, tests. It's eight additional tests if you want to do a cardiac uh, risk assessment. The Cleveland Clinic cardiac risk assessment, that's an add-on that we could do. We could add on uh, hormonal, we could add on uh, cancer, which screens for about 80% of cancers in men and women, and then we can add on the heart, Cleveland Clinic heart assessment. But they now throw in two of those markers into the normal uh, exam, so that was mm -hmm. good. Um, somebody brought me in today, uh, she gets, a lot of people say, well, I could go to get this done by my doctor, I, could, I just got a blood test done a while back and I use that. Well, he shows you that when they do that, they're, they're, you can add it to profiling, but you get know, like a lot of blanks because a lot of those tests leave a lot of, they don't do a lot of the tests that he's in, included into this test. So, and then she showed me, so Dr. Milkle charges for uh, 550 for this exam. He said this test would cost you anywhere from four to $8,000 if you were billing it through insurance. But because he's contracted with Quest and LabCorp, he's their largest account they have nationwide. He, he negotiated cash-friendly fees. He does not want to deal with insurance. He just wants to keep insurance. He doesn't want them to know anything about you, and then they have to. You know, so, like, I'm going to be going for my uh, life insurance expired, expires in the January, so I'm looking for another plan. Oh, now I'm in another age category, so that's going to be, so they're going to be tested and all that. All right, fine, they're going to test me, but I just did my test, and I actually came up, I think, fairly decent. The things that they value, you know, blood pressure, sugar, uh, cholesterol, I mean, I'm going to do fine on all that stuff. The things that I value... They're not going to even look at like the things that we got on our test that were out of whack, probably more than anything. 
were found in the hair analysis. <clears throat> so that's why we do hair analysis. What does hair here tell you? Here's what the body's excreting. Okay, so um, the thing that we found and that we look at are the toxic elements. Okay, so just as a, a, a back up a second, when you do this test, on the one side of it, it's going to say what the clinical ranges are. Clinical ranges are the acceptable ranges when you go to your doctor and get a test. Um, but if you got like a high or low marker, you'd be outside those clinical ranges. But are those clinical ranges optimal health ranges? Not really. They're, they're averages of everybody that the labs have tested over the last few years. So what has happened to clinical ranges over the years? As America has gotten sicker, the ranges have gotten bigger and wider. Like the bell curve just got wider and wider. So they keep expanding these ranges. And so even though you might be within that clinical range, that doesn't mean you're in an optimal range. So what he did, and, and I really think, um, I, I can't prove this, but 30 some years ago, I took a seminar up in Connecticut by these two medical doctors that were doing something almost identical to this. They called it NutriBalance. Yeah. And they were doing the same thing. They wow. said back then that these lab ranges were not optimal ranges. And they compressed it, so they took of that range, they narrowed it down to 30, give or take 30% of that range. So they took the midpoint, added 15% or 16% on either side of that, and they called that the health range. And then anything beyond that, you were already getting, you know, inside the clinical range, you still weren't optimally in the, in the health range. So what he did was that he took that, and what you see yellow on here, those are the, the mild elevations or depressions. You're either above or below the health range. And then as you get to a more of a more critical warning level, you're gonna have a red marker. And then as it gets to critical, we call stat, it'll be blue. So in the beginning, when you do your first test, you'll see like how much, you know, um, yellow, reds, and blues, and especially the ones we focus mostly on are the reds and blues right off the bat. You want to get rid of those and get them back into the yellow ranges and then yellow back to white. So that's what you'll get. You'll get that on your blood markers and then also on your hair. So the next would be hair, which would be your toxic heavy metals. Mama. And then down here, your Mama. good minerals, your good mineral levels. Um, so this is the thing I think that brought out a lot of our stuff that was like eye opening to us. And we're still trying to figure some things out. Angie, she had high like high metals, and hers were different than ours. Mm -hmm. We had uh, high arsenic, high copper, Mama. and and the copper really kind of bothered me because I read a book about uh, before we moved into our house 20 years ago. We built our Mama. house, and um, I read this book by I think it was Susan Clark. She's an in, a naturopath, and she was talking about cancer, and she was blaming cancer on parasites. And somehow she was linking parasites to high copper levels. And she's saying because there's high copper in different areas of the country in the water supply and the fact that people use copper pipes in their house, that you're literally leaching that copper, you're drinking it. If you ever did, like when we got into Lifetime Cookware, it's stainless steel cookware, when the guy came to the house to do the demo, he was like showing you, what other pots do you have? You have aluminum pots, give me an aluminum pot. You have a copper bottom, give me a copper pot. And then he, what do you do with the copper pot? He boiled water in it. And then he poured it, he let it cool down, then he poured it into a little glass, and he says, here, drink, drink some of this. And what did it taste like? Metal. You were drinking pennies. It tasted like copper. You could, you saw that copper was leaching off into whatever you were cooking, and you were drinking it. So, like, obviously, we don't have copper pots, and, and when I built my house, she said, if you can, rip out all the copper piping and replace it with PVC. Well, we were building a house, so we didn't put any copper in. We did all our house in PVC. So then I'm wondering, where the heck is the copper coming from? So we drink well water, we had our well water test, and it wasn't copper in that. So I'm still trying to figure out where, where is this stuff coming from. So this is where you could be doing everything you think you possibly can be doing to keep yourself well and healthy, and you're getting sabotaged from some other outside source that you have no idea. Like, that, that was one, and the bigger like, other one was arsenic. Mm -hmm. He linked at the seminar, he had a case where the guy had high levels of arsenic and he got leukemia. Mm -hmm. And so he, he was linking that to the high arsenic levels and we've already had a patient that's fighting leukemia, 30 years old, and he had high arsenic levels. See, so we're looking at that going, well, so we're doing all this stuff and we're getting whacked.
spectrum mm -hmm. be somewhere. It's like you're getting like who shot Kennedy? Where did the bullet come? You don't even yeah. know where the bullet's coming from. You don't know where to duck or which direction. So we're trying to figure that out. But in the meantime, we at least know we have a strategy to chelate, and we're doing you know chelation to get the heavy metals out. One of the things, <coughs> as we've been testing patients, we're seeing a lot of patients with high toxic metals. Mm -hmm. And part of it we all have to recognize is where we live. You know, we have had mills and mines in these areas for the last hundred years. So it's in the clouds, it's in, it's in the, the ground. water, it's in the mm -hmm. ground, it's in our food. Yeah. But one of the big points we saw was that all these years where we have done supplementation, <clears throat> we have not done chelation. Mm -hmm. We have taken things in, but we've done very little to chelate out things yeah, that we right. may have accumulated mm -hmm. all these years. So we're going, oh, arsenic or copper, but we might have just accumulated that over the last 60 years of our living. So now, though, we are doing things to chelate that stuff out of us. Mm -hmm. so. so that's like part of the program, chelate. Yeah. I had one test done. Our friend Joe Brayhill had a, some type of a bath. Mm -hmm. It's reflexology. Mm -hmm. foot bath. Do the foot yeah. bath, yeah, the foot the, bath. Mm -hmm. Take the copper out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And my water was so dirty. Mm -hmm. So much metal. Why? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But it was dirty. It looked like... Yes, well, my husband water. is a water yeah. chemist, and he yes. services like all the yeah, water treatment yeah. plants in the area. Yeah. They all have cast iron and lead pipes. So even we were just discussing this because we we were putting a whole house filter on our house because the three of us in my house that got tested already all had astronomical metal metals levels, and my ten year old that got tested hasn't had the years of exposure that I have at forty. But his levels were almost as high as mine. So there's some environmental factor. And we, we have a chemical-free house. We grow so much of our own food. Like, you know, we eat organic as much as possible. We only eat local meat that's organically raised. Like, we're not even buying stuff at the store for most of our diet. But his levels were still so high. So we were discussing with a plumber this week about, like, is it worth ripping out the lead pipes coming into our yard? He said no, because... The whole town is you're like the whole water system is lead pipes. You're better off putting like a filter in your house and at least protecting your house water mm -hmm. like through the filter. That's what they do at their house. They have a whole house water filtration system so you can get out like the big things right. and then making sure that you're drinking water like we got the Berkey filter right. so that our drinking water at least is is cleaner. But, you know, reducing exposure is one thing. And then there comes a point where you're like, okay, well, you're getting exposed so forget even how, like, you can only control so many things. Now we just focus on the chelation and the dietary stuff as much as possible. And he doesn't love, he can't swallow capsules. He doesn't love opening up those <laughs> chlorella and putting it in applesauce or something, but he's doing it. So, you know, we'll see when we retest him um, how his levels go. The bottom line in all of this is we would never even have known. We wouldn't even have known. So you know, we, we had no we idea. We all have been doing so many things to keep ourselves healthy between exercise and our diets and our supplementation and chiropractic care. We would not even have known where we were at without the testing. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so cool. I actually found a, a hair analysis that I did three years ago yesterday as I was looking through my notes and I did not have the arsenic in there. It was like almost non, I think back then it was aluminum was bigger. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's something that's been more recent. Well, that's the, you know? that's the change in the food system though. Like that's only been the last couple of years that we've been shipping our meat overseas to be processed and then they they put it in arsenic to bring it back so that's something that's routinely yeah. discussed in the food industry so there are things that were and they said i was when we were researching researching the heavy metals after we figured like we can't change the water system like nationally to fix the problem um we started looking into like why did we have such high nickel why did we have so many so we started researching all the 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 exposures and they said 99 percent of it is in the food system yeah. they said even like we had our soil tested and our soil that we we have trucked into my organic garden was full of nickel it was full of uh copper it was it was um it was like four of my heavy metals were in my soil they weren't in my water but they were in my soil so even my organic food isn't free and they said anything you buy in the grocery store is going to be super high nickel i don't wear costume jewelry i couldn't figure out why my numbers were so high they said no that's largely the food the aluminum is from canned food but we don't eat a lot of canned food now we didn't have aluminum i think did you guys you didn't either but we've seen it on some people's tests come back really high aluminum 
as their primary, but they might be doing more canned foods. Um, you know, we can ours in, in glass jars, but we don't can them in metal. So that would be a concern too. If, if someone's diet would be high in like processed food, you might see more of that. But he said even the produce in the store is loaded with like nickel and high copper because of industrial farming. So he said that's a common thing that you're gonna see in like the big agricultural areas, which is why we might have it in the groundwater. If, cause this is a big farming area. Between the mills and the farms, we might really just be overexposed than a different part of the country, you know? So it's just things to think about, but we can't change the outside stuff, but you can be more aware the chelation should be something we are doing regularly, you know, and at least getting checked to see where we're at. And that's what the test showed us is that we were way more toxic than what we thought we would have been after 20 years of organic living. Yeah, I, I have PVC and I had copper, but I bet you most of you here have copper pipes mm -hmm. in your house. And a few years ago before my dad passed, I, I was called to his house because his potter room downstairs, he had a little bathroom off the, from the kitchen. And he was leaking from the upstairs bathroom. It was leaking, it was coming down. So he had like ceiling tile like this and it was all stained, you know, from the water spots and whatever. So I said, I'll go fix that for him. So I went in and I took off a bunch of towel and you could see water dripping off the uh, pipes. So I went up there with the thing and I went to grab it to push, the, to put a towel around it. And my thumb went right through the thing and water started dripping out. And I was like, oh my gosh, so I ran downstairs and I shut the water off you know, in the house. And then I came up again, and, and this pipe it went the length of this powder room. I started pushing my thumb, and, going, shh, shh. and I was pushing my thumb. I pushed my thumb through this much of that pipe, and that was one, and he had another one there, and I did the same dang on thing. And so I had to replace the whole section, uh, the whole section, a few feet of pipe uh, in there. So where did all the copper go? Yeah. And I talked to you know, Hannah, and Hannah's, I said, oh, how can that copper, you think of metal, when you look at a copper pipe and it's like this thick or whatever, you think metal is metal, metal's not going anywhere, right? And metal's gonna be, some, it was nothing, it was like paper, it was like, not even paper, like a wafer that I could just stick yeah. my thumb through. And he said that when water runs horizontal, like that, and it stays in the pipe, it starts leaching the metal off the pipe, and the pipe will get thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner, and after many years, there was nothing left of the diagonal pipe. So where do you think all that went to my dad that didn't have his wrist on him for the last two, three years of his life? You know, it went into his body somewhere. It could have whacked his brain, you know, you, you know, we know aluminum will give you Alzheimer's and what have you. What about all this other stuff? When I went to uh, Dr. Merkel with the last test, I told him, I said, look, I've been fighting a kidney thing for the last year and a half. My mother lost a kidney, my brother's had two transplants. I don't want to have kidney problems. And, and I've been shown like a low-grade kidney infection. He looked at my thing, he goes, oh, you got arsenic, you got copper. He said, that's it right there. I said, the arsenic. And like right away, he said, boom, arsenic and copper. So that becomes more important, you know, that um, I said, 60 years of my life, I never had this. So why in the last year and a half, I can't shake this thing? He says it's the metals. So I would never have never known that. And I was taking like kidney related type supplements and it really, really wasn't wasn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm real curious to see. I've already seen improvement in my urine uh, in the three months we've been doing this. But we still have to figure out where is it coming from. Yeah. Otherwise it's like we we're in the we're in the, the rowboat out in the middle of the lake with a hole in it and all we do is hand it up. We have a bucket now. Yeah. We're just going to do, just keep doing this for the rest of our lives. And I don't want to do that. I want to fix the hole in the Well, boat. one thing, like she's mentioned about the chicken, is I'm only buying organic chicken from now on. I was not before. Yeah. You know, and trying to go into more plant-based proteins as well. So you're not even getting as much, but, yeah. you know, yeah. controlling all our meat, you know, controlling more of the things I can control. But again, I would never have known and the, uh, the science-based testing recommends you get, you know, your blood, your, it, it's a combination of your blood, your urine, your stool, your hair, and, you know, your evaluation, your own symptom survey. And then you get into a supplement program that you run a minimum of two months. Um, and then after two to three months, based upon your problems, if you have serious problems, like our cancer patients, we're testing them sooner than, th than three months, but everyone else is two to three months, you might get another test for your blood work, and it'll allow you to compare. Right. You know, it's, it's amazing how you can, it'll show you, you know, this, like I think yeah. the one that you one showed, showed, you showed a comparison, like original, test to, original to the next test, and then the hair may be in four to six months uh, to start to see what changes are. Mm -hmm. And um, 
so you'll see whether what you're doing is getting better or worse. Um, the cancer numbers, you can see like what your cancer numbers are and they go down, you know, or whatever, down or up, and you can see where you're at, if what you're doing is working, if it's helping you, which is a really amazing way to evaluate your overall health. And it just puts you on the right path. But I have to say that many people, when they get their first reports, they grieve a little. <laughs> we all grieve a little. And then you say, okay, put on my big girl panties, and now I'm going to move into fixing some of whatever I can fix. Right. And um, well, it's fine. I want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because, again, I, I had a good friend recently contacted me, and, and they told him um, that he might have early um, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And the neurologist told him, he says, you, you might have three years. Now, his only symptom right now is he's, he's, he can't, he's for the last five, six years, his speech has been deteriorating, which I've been telling him, you've got to do something about this. And I, and I would put him on some things, and he would do it short term, you know, two weeks, three weeks, and then and then next day he'd come in and say, you doing your stuff? He'd say, no. And he, he, but now it's getting so bad, he can't even understand a word he says when he no. talks. It's, and so now he went to the neurologist, and the neurologist, when the neurologist said, you might have three years, that was like dropping an atomic bomb on him. And now, then he contacted me, he says, you got to help me, because they didn't give him any solutions. You know, you got this, it's like, you know, Luke Gary, so this is a neuronal disease, it's just going to be progressive, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and when it affects your breathing muscles and swallowing muscles, then that's going to be it, and you're going to be finished. And we had a friend die from that, we knew about 20 years ago. And uh, he died in his early 60s, same as this. And um, I don't want to see anybody go through that, it was horrible, you know. So, with the types of uh, cases that he shares at the seminars, people with stuff like this do get better. You know, uh, if you go and look online at, um, you know, the Hair Clippers Wall, W-A-H-L, you know, you could get at Walmart or anywhere. There's a Dr. Terry Wall, she has a TED Talk and you can find it on YouTube. And she had uh, crippling uh, progressive uh, multiple sclerosis where she was getting worse and worse and worse. She was on steroids, she was on all kinds of drugs. She taught in a medical school, neurology of all things. And uh, she was getting worse and worse and worse. And she said, I saw myself going nowhere fast. She was getting a reclined wheelchair. She couldn't even sit upright anymore. She was leaning back. And so she went on PubMed and started researching is there anything else that can be done for this? And she started finding like references to vitamin D, to you know, greens and, uh, and antioxidants and stuff. And so she put herself on a program like a paleo type diet, mostly lean meats, vegetables and fruit. Like she said, six servings of vegetables and greens a day, four servings and four cups of, uh, of uh, uh, berries and antioxidants. And I don't know what the time frame was, you can watch her story. She completely healed herself completely healed herself to where she celebrated her healing. I think she said she went on a month bike ride, camping trip through the Sierra Nevada mountains to celebrate her victory over this. And now she's teaching, you see her walking on TED Talks, walk around like you're talking to, and she'll say, drugs do not heal the human body. Only nutrition can heal the human body. This is a woman taught in medical school for years till it whacked her. And then she saw that drugs do not heal the body. You don't get sick from lack of drugs. You get sick from lack of nutrition. Royal Lee, who found the standard process, said that in 1954, Americans are, are the most overfed and undernourished uh, population uh, of people on this planet. And he says, the number one disease affecting Americans today is starvation. We are eating, but not getting nourished. And that was 1954. What do you think it'd say today? It'd be a lot worse. So anyway, uh, any questions before I wrap up here? Anybody? get the idea of it, we'll be around after, and to talk about that and the testing and whatever, if you're interested in getting getting going on that. So, yeah, we're gonna follow up, we're gonna do some classes, we're gonna continue to, because we know we have to support this more than, you know, it's not just about supplements. I write in everybody's report, supplements are supplements. They're not substitutes. For like a, a guy was here today, he told me uh, about six months ago, he went and got a blood test. His A1C, he was one, one year younger than me. His A1C was 12.5. And the doctor told him about it and he says, he says, I realize I gotta start changing some things. So he was, he has been changing, he cut out the carbs, he cut out the excessive sugars and alcohol and things like that that he was doing. 
And he said, I'm down to 7.5 now. He says, is there something more I could be doing? And I said, yes, there is. There's things you can be doing. But actually, that was pretty good mm -hmm. in my mind to go from 12 and a half to f seven and a half right. in four to six months with diet. So yeah, I said, yeah, there's exercise factors you need to do. So you have to continue to work with the diet a, a few more. And there's definitely supplements you could do that can speed up this process. So that's a lot of the doctor's testimonials for similar cases to that. All right, yep. so we'll be here for a few more minutes. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Let's all have a Merry Christmas and a happy, happy New Year. <laughs> God bless us, everyone. Yeah.